Thank you. Thank you, Danny. So today, we're going to be talking about um, design activism. Now, I've, I've, uh, you know, it sounds way more antagonistic than it is, <laughs> which is why I kind of went with a bit of license here, and I went lowercase with it. So just to downplay, it's not, you know, it's not activism necessarily. We'll see, actually, we'll see when we go through. Um, and I'm Dan Harris, I'm in uppercase, I'm not antagonistic. Um, I am a designer, I work at a place called CX Partners in uh, Bristol with a beautiful team um, in a beautiful place. Um, I'm also a member of a, um, a, a group called Five Rights. Uh, we're a, a lobbying think tank um, and we work with the amazing Baroness Beban Kidron um, to represent children's rights uh, in the digital world. And we conduct research, um, we work with lawyers to lobby for some new laws um, to empower children online. We also build products like this, which is um, a product called um, Zone, Zone App. And what it does is it helps teenagers, uh, children, but also adults <laughs> to, um, to control their digital lives. And it's really simple. You can kind of set uh, a location or a time for when you want certain services to be active or not. So it stops you know, notifications coming in from you know, Instagram when I'm over here or when I'm you know, at, at work, I can stop um, other notifications coming in from other social networks. We're going to be testing it with 100 kids in Scotland very soon. And we're building it not as a product to release, but building it as a way of um, conducting that research. So we're going to find out if this does actually lead to better well-being, better mental well-being with those children. And we're looking for volunteers, actually, to help with this. So I'm going to flash my contact at the, up at the end. And if you want to start helping, um, please do get in touch. Oh, and the other thing about me. I went to a really shit school in Birmingham. And it looked like that. And I, couldn't, I can't believe it. This is actually an actual picture of this school. Um, I didn't know it was so shit at the time. Um, I just thought that's how it, that's what it was. And that's how, you know, it's what it should be, maybe. But then something happened, so I, I moved away um, and came to the view that actually everything is subject to change. What's done before doesn't have to be the norm. And this was, this was back in uh, sort of 1996. We, we've gone back a lot in time with a few of these talks. My 1996 looked like this. Um, there, you know, this is the period of beige PCs, um, Netsta Netscape, uh, we had dial-up internet, uh, we had ya Yahoo, bless their souls. And um, <laughs> at, th at this point, digital was, was set to be nothing less than absolutely revolutionary. It was, it was gonna make the oblique transparent. It was going to make what was closed really open. It was going to make what was disparate, connected, and democratic. It was a really exciting time, but something else happened. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But before then, I want to tell you a story about these folks. They're, these folks are the Mennonite community, um, mainly in the States. Um, and they're a farming and religious community. What's interesting is they don't use tractors with rubber tires. Instead, they use these steel tires, and they, they tr sort of trundle along you know, at the speed of the horses. And why is this? Well, this is a question asked by uh, Klaas Martins, who's a, a, a leading organic uh, farmer in the States. And he asked this of a Mennonite bishop. And he said, why do you forbid the use of rubber tires? And he went on to, to, to answer the question with another question. When do you start raising a child? And he began telling, uh, telling this story about in the Mennonite community, child rearing begins not at birth or even at conception, but 100 years before that child is born. Because that's when you start building the environment they're going to be living in. Mennonites believe if you look at the history of tractors with rubber tires, you see failure within a generation. 
because rubber tires mean easy movement for those tractors, which inevitably means that the farm will grow, make more profit, acquire more land, less crop diversity, more farm machinery, so on. What happens then? Farmer becomes less intimate with the land. That lack of intimacy leads to ignorance, which finally leads to loss, which could be over 100 years later. But it's the loss of the right environment into which that child will be born. So how does this relate to what we're going to talk about today? <laughs> well, of course, it's about digital. This is where we are with digital right now. As the market has grown, so have these massive sort of forces of digital. They've come with us. And actually, we, we, we can't seem to do without them. You know, they've really enabled brand new, amazing things in our lives. And they're developing technology like you wouldn't believe in AI, robotics. Um, you know, you've got Google Translate um, inventing its own language in order to translate two other languages that it needs to learn. And you've also got other deeper tech, biotech, mashups with AR. Um, I found this the other day. This is, um, this is called the bionic lens. <laughs> it's a dynamic lens, and it, it replaces the eye's uh, natural lens through a, 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 um, a really common uh, procedure, cataract surgery. And and it, the, the, the inventor claims, the inventor is uh, Garth Webb, and he claims that this lens can improve vision of someone who has 20-20 vision by 300%. It's connected to AR, and he's also worked out a way of connecting it to the muscles that change the curvature of that lens, allowing you to see much wider angles. So, I mean, mind-blowing technology. It's just incredible. And it's really helped to move on digital. So I call this sort of deep tech. I think that's moved digital on, and digital is where we are at. That's where, that's the industry. That's the place, that, that's the kind of coalface that we're at. And it's helped us as designers to create products that are more compelling, more engaging, um, and make more, life more convenient for people, which is great. Um, but it's not actually digital, it's not tech, it's actually, it is design. We're here because we are designers. And more specifically, if you're talking about making things compelling, we're probably using a lot more behavioral design techniques um, than, than we used to. And I think that has come from um, a lot of areas, uh, but there's, a, there's, there's one guy that's really started to, or he did, start to um, really move the theory on, and this guy is called uh, Nir Isle. And he wrote a book called Hooked. You may know it. I heard him speak a few years ago at a product uh, conference, um, and he, he was promoting his book. And it sets out techniques for creating products that keep customers coming back for more, um, using psychological tricks like varying the, the, the rewards that you get um, and to help people create these cravings, um, exploiting negative emotions that can act as triggers, um, feeling of, feelings of loss and frustration and confusion, um, leading to you know, this uh, instantaneous, mindless action to quell that negative sensation. So this idea of you know, pulling down the refresh on Facebook, pulling down uh, the refresh on all of your social media feeds, being constantly... Um, wanting to see the rest of the content. It's this action that he talks about. It's a bit like, it's a bit like uh, donuts, because he used, this, he used this analogy more recently. So that was back in 2014. We're now today, and he's recently um, been a bit spooked by um, how he sees this use of, or this misuse, actually, of persuasive design. Um, and he addressed the conference and he said, just, so, just as we can't really blame the baker for creating such delicious treats, we can't blame tech makers for making their products so good that we want to use them. And he says, of course, that's what tech companies will do. And frankly, do we want it any other way? Well, the question is, 
do we want it any other way? Has this put the rubber tires on our tractor? And let's stick with the, the donuts for a minute, actually, because uh, adults, you know, we're responsible for whether we you know, succumb to a delicious donut or pull down Facebook to refresh. But as children, they're not at an age when they can vote, they're not on an age where they can drive a car, but they're being increasingly targeted with this tech. And there's a lot of evidence now, it's growing actually, that it's making them unhappy. And Jean M. Twenge, she's a researcher in the States, and she's spent uh, 25 years uh, studying intergenerational behavior, where changes, they, they normally, of course, appear pretty slowly between generations, but she's recently been um, horrified, actually, by the stark changes she's seen in what she calls iGen. And iGen are people that have been born between 1995 and 2012. And she's found incredible um, you know, results that fall off a cliff, like number of hours spent with friends off a cliff, reduced number of hours sleeping off a cliff, increased unhappiness. Most desperate of all is this result that 50%, oh, sorry, girls, specifically girls, depressive symptoms have increased by 50% in three years since 2012 to 2015. So what's going on here? So in 2007, this generation was between, their, their age was between 12 and 19. And what else happened in 2007? It was when the iPhone was introduced. And teens, so teens now really grow up with smartphones as part of their lives. And okay, millennials grew up with the web as well, but it wasn't nearly as close to them. With the web, you kind of have to go to it. With smartphones, things come to you. And it's that distraction that is having an effect. So what are the tech companies doing about this? Well, depressingly, not much at all. And in fact, a recently leaked Facebook a document indicated that the company had been touting to its advertisers its ability to um, determine teens' emotional states based on their online behavior, and to even pinpoint moments when young people need a confidence boost. This is quite extraordinary. They're actually making it worse. Okay, now let's look at... Um, this sort of new paradigm that we're getting into. So you can now um, you know, order a table. Order a, you know, I feel like a eating Italian tonight. I can tell Alexa and she'll go away and beaver away and do it. And uh, she'll, she'll connect to uh, Open Table. Um, Open Table will connect to that restaurant. Um, the restaurant actually has to pay a fee to license the software to run on their systems in the restaurant. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll go along to the, to the meal, um, pay the bill. A part of that bill um, is taken by OpenTable as a, another part of their fee structure. The question is, who pays for this? Who pays for that in the, in the economic sense? Well, it's not a customer. They're not charging me more. Um, it's actually the people that are squeezed hard already. It's the people that work in the kitchen, the porters. If you get it delivered to you, it's the delivery drivers. Those that are already squeezed are getting squeezed harder. And it's this sort of super slick consumerism that is happening through here. And we heard it, actually, in a couple of other talks around... You know, the idea of Spotify, I can get everything I want now. And what's happened to that idea of kind of searching something out and feeling your way through a music catalog rather than it all coming to you? There's a certain beauty in that friction. And it's being taken away from us, actually. And it's meaning that we don't know what happens under the hood. 
we're getting less intimate with how things work. And if you look at the best architecture in the world, this is actually really important for humans, is to understand how things work. If you understand how a building works, you can understand it aesthetically. That's what the best architecture does. We're becoming less intimate with how things work. That lack of intimacy is leading to ignorance. And ignorance, as we know, leads to loss. And in this case, loss for the humans in that super slickness. And the gap's widening. And before you know it, we've put tires back on the tractor. OK, so what can we do? Am I just being over-idealistic? Uh, is this just over-ambitious? Uh, am what am I asking for here? Could we actually change this? Well, I do think, and I think you know that there is a real power in the fact that you are designers. Design has a remit to bring positive change. You all work in digital, probably within organizations or for organizations. Your very presence in those organizations is an acknowledgement from them with you that you are working on behalf of the human. And the further we get into deep tech, the more we need to understand that human. And it's not just about how they use a piece of software or the interface. It's about the external forces that affect people. Economics, technology, politics, ideas, systems. We're hearing all about it today. It affects people's lives, their needs, their motivations. If we don't understand those things, those external forces, and if we don't have an opinion on them, then we're arguably abandoning our responsibility as designers. And Buckminster Fuller puts it pretty well himself, actually. Our profession is between utopia and obliv oblivion, and he says, it'll be oblivion if we continue focusing on minor aesthetic problems. However, it might turn into utopia if we're able to tackle the major societal challenges of our time. Imagine that. And Tim Brown of IDEO, he's, uh, he's got similar um, perspectives. He was asked recently if, um, if he could say a few words on the future of what a designer will be. And so he says, um, everything we design has to be a learning system. It can't just be an artifact. So much to technology today makes it possible. Sensors, smart software, they learn about what's happening. They learn what people are doing. Designers have to ensure that those learnings benefit everyone, not just the corporations that, who build the code. So it's a common theme, and we have heard it today. From a, from a few speakers, it's been fantastic. But how's it going to affect my business, my, my practice, my organization, my role as a designer? Well, put simply, it's kind of corporate demise. We've, we've, we've heard a few people mention this existence issue today. So let me explain. So this actually has come from this guy, Richard Foster. He did some research. He found that... Um, you know, given the trends in 2027, 25% of the S&P 500 won't exist. And there's a lot of theory about, well, why is that? And I think, you know, if we can boil it down to one thing, I think it's something around the sheer uncontrollable rate of change in customer and employee expectations. And if your organization or who you work with, you're not orientating around those expectations, then there's a risk. If you're not understanding everything you can about the human stakeholders in your service, then there's a risk. So expectations, what kinds of expectations am I talking about? I kind of love and hate this picture. I particularly love the, the pixel nature of this, this picture. But I, I, I love it because it's, um, 
I don't know, it kind of is about young people and their expectations, but I hate it because it doesn't really represent diversity. Anyway, let's talk about millennials. So their expectations. 81% of millennials expect their favorite companies to make public declarations of their cor corporate citizenship. 81%. Most millennials expect that. That starts to kind of make you think, well, if companies aren't taking their responsibility in their community, in their society, seriously, then they're r at real risk. And not just with sponsorship or CSR programs, but in the way they serve and operate. This has to be genuine. So what do I mean by operate as well? Well, if we're looking after employees well, and we're looking after customers well, then we're really looking after our clients' interests. And then there's also the expectations of iGen. It's not looking good for capitalism, I must say. 51% of young US citizens no longer support the system of capitalism. I need some water. And actually, I must say, I'm, I'm kind of not surprised because um, they're seeing massive gaps in their, their societies. The vast majority of the US population, their income grew 42%. However, the top 19%, it grew by 70%. The top 1% grew by 192%. And this is just the developed world. And actually, I want to stay with the developed world for a minute, because um, that's where we do have a sphere of influence. I honestly believe that. So how do we do it? Well, this is where I, I kind of come back to design activism. And uh, maybe it's in uppercase here for a reason. Um, I think it's an acknowledgment that, that you can change things. You can change things. And it has to come from the heart. And it has to come from knowing what you want to change, having that opinion. But, it, but you know, how do you get to there? Oh, it takes research, understanding history, politics, understanding a context, understanding the systems that surround the humans that we're working for. And it's what psychologists call this kind of internal locus of agency, the feeling that I can make that change and I'm, I can do that stuff that I want to do. It's not these external forces that are, are having that effect on me. That's external locus of agency. Okay, so what does that look like? What does that mean for day to day? So I've got a few examples, actually. I've got five principles and a few examples, some of the work that I've been involved in, some of other work around the world. Um, and there are many more, of course, than these five, but this may just help us kick off. Um, it's what I've used to sort of keep the rubber tires at bay. Okay, so number one, the joy of design research. And um, I mean, I think research will, will be at the heart of many of your practices. Um, but specifically, design research, it's super powerful at uncovering surprising insights. It can turn a project from an interface project, we just heard about interface projects, maybe they're not right anymore, into a project that has impacts beyond, far beyond what was in the brief. We interviewed um, quite a few people for a mortgage project for a bank recently. We asked a really simple question. What does home feel like? And we, the videos came back in, and we, you know, we took them to the client. And it had this incredible effect of turning the project from being a mortgage project into a home buying project. The, the, the language changed completely for what, what we were talking about. In fact, we, we banned the word mortgage. Design research should change the language of a project. And... Uh, it allowed us to do 
really fantastic ideation and we came up with some, some concepts around, well, actually, if it's about home buying, or even not even home owning, about homes, what, what do we need to do as a bank with our assets, our customer book, in order to make that happen for people? And we came up with some ideas around you know, alternative um, forms of um, checking people's potential. We called them, started calling, you know, not, not customers or mortgage applicants, we call, started calling them um, business partners, because actually that's what's happening when you get a mortgage. That's what's happen, happening when you kind of work with a bank. To home sharing, to crowdsource funding, really interesting ideas. Anyway, so my tip for getting started in this sort of space, um, any opportunity you have with customers, and you'll, you know, you'll be running user tests, you may have five minutes at the end that are spare. Do not let people go. Ask them really simple, basic questions, and then ask why. So, you know, we ask this question, how do you feel about home? If it's a retail project, what do you love about shopping? Then ask why. Why is a brilliant, brilliant question, because you can ask it two or three times, and you really get to the bottom of something. Don't ask it more than five. It gets really weird. <laughs> OK. Number two, challenging, really challenging design principles. So we, we love design principles, don't we? <laughs> I'm actually addicted to them. Anyone else? Nope. OK. Awkward. Um, but they have, to be, they have to be challenging. They have to contribute to changing the language, changing the project. And off the back of the, the research we did for home buying, we came up with a few that made such a difference to the direction of the project. And we could sort of um, couch them in this way of, you know, where we were before, and this is where we want to be now. What did we have? We had things like, you know, instead of realizing profit, realizing value. Customers to business partners. The bank as an authority to the bankers, allowing an environment for respect, trust, and championing customer value. Really kind of interesting shifts to the, that shifted mindsets. Okay, number three, purpose. So, we're, you know, how far away is, is the founding purpose from what your organization does day to day? It's, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to maintain. But as designers, it's really important that we bring what we do back to what the company was founded on in the first place. And it actually comes from brand, which is the opportunity for us, actually. We're in that space of brand. And brand isn't, you know, here I'm talking about brand, not typography, colors. It's actually where typography and colors came from. It's what people expect of the organization. And that is what links to what, why they were in the first place. And those things have got to be good things. Those expectations have got to be good, because if they weren't, that company wouldn't exist in the first place. So some examples here. Uh, we're working with a company called Wiltshire Farm Food. They create and deliver meals for uh, people that are housebound. Um, and this is, their, this is their purpose, to bring joy to life. And it's just... Empowering, it's just an opener of opportunity as a designer, as an entrepreneur, actually. How else can we, you know, how deep do you want to go with this? That's the question I always ask myself. How else do we bring joy to life to those customers and to these guys, employees? How can we make the service even more valuable to them using this as a kind of driver, this message? And Tesla's got got a, a, a similarly um, powerful purpose. And you can see how that really um, drives what they do in their products today. So my tip for getting started here, get, in, get involved in branding workshops. Understand why the, the organization exists and why that's important for people. 
and let that guide your design work. Let purpose guide your design work. Okay, number four. Creating badass humans. This is actually stolen from someone called Cathy Sierra, although she did have create badass users back in 2014. I've kind of blown it up a bit more. Um, this was a product management conference again. Um, and she was talking about this in terms of a photographer's app. So there's one way of thinking about a photographer's app and how you really make a fantastic experience, a fantastic app, is to think about the product, think about the app. But she, she said, well, actually, we're not trying to do that. We're trying to make fantastic photographers. That's what we're trying to do. It's not about the app, it's about them. And we've heard again a lot about this shift of focus. So, these guys relaunch, they're doing that right now. They've moved it on even further from an app to uh, an AI first service. And in fact, Google have moved from mobile first to AI first. But this is just a fantastic business model. So what happens is you don't actually buy the hardware. You don't pay money for the hardware. The hardware comes to you. You apply for it. It comes to you. Um, what you do pay for is when you take photos, are uploaded to the cloud, some machine learning in the cloud understands which of those photos are good photos, enhances them, and presents them to you, and you can buy the photos for a dollar a pop. What a fantastic business model. You don't own the hardware anymore. You own the, the photos. You own being a brilliant photographer. The hardware, the interface does not matter. No need to trawl through my photos. No need to upload them from that memory stick to manage my archive simply paying for good photos. It's all that people need. And it's something that Barclays are doing with their digital eagles, and they've, they've been doing it for a while now. So how did they do this? Because what, what, what digital eagles does is it helps their customers be better at digital. So why have they done that? <laughs> well, I think fundamentally, it was a business decision. They understood that there was a huge market in those that didn't have digital skills. And like Relaunch, like the home buying project, they didn't focus on their classic personas. They almost went to the opposite side. Who are the other personas that we're not considering? That actually there's a massive market in. And they presented real challenges, these, these personas. And so they came up with new ideas. What a brilliant driver for new ideas. They were gritty personas. They weren't stock photos. That's why they were compelled to help individuals in this market, simply upskill them and become the people that they wanted to become. And that had a massive business impact. Okay, final principle on the way down now. So design the operation to be lean. This is like a true service design principle. Um, but, you know, as UX folks, service design is, is becoming super critical. You know, as we've, we, we, we've heard from other talks, you know, this is about stakeholders in the system. Sets out, because service design sets out how a service will operate, not only in the, in the back stage, but in the front stage, how it's experienced. But critically, it asks this question, how can the organization be optimized so that service can be maximized around human needs? How can it be optimized to offer maximized experience around human needs? And increasingly, it's about how we can use AI to do that, to optimize it. And some of you may have heard of, of these guys, Lemonade, insurance company. Anyone heard of them? Oh, awesome. So you'll know they've got just the most incredible business model. Police are in. Um, they're, they're, they're an insurance startup in the US. And their purpose is to turn insurance from a necessary evil to a social good. 
wow, this is insurance. How have they, how have they done that? They're, so when you sign up, there are no T's and C's. The application form is absolutely minuscule. You get a quote in seconds. And when you sign up as well, you can choose a charity of your choice. And if you don't claim for the duration of your premium, 20% of your premium goes to that charity. And they're super upfront about this. It's really transparent. And that honesty and openness is what they instill in their customers. So in effect, they're asking their customers, as stakeholders of the service, to be operators of their service. They're carrying out the Lemonade mission just by being customers. And it doesn't stop there. So what they've managed to do is uh, they're, they're, they're able to deal with claims in a, in a radical way using AI. And recently, they've, they've been able to assess a claim, process the payout, the payout, and make the payment within three seconds. And only by using AI in this way are they able to operate a business model like that, similarly to relaunch, to create that revolutionary service around what customers care about, not about what their business cares about, what their industry cares about. And they've managed to make a positive dent on society and on, on their way. So my, my tip for getting started with this kind of inspirational story here, ask questions of that backstage, of that operation. We heard about the system, you know, go further into the system, into the stakeholders over there. Add operations stakeholders to your blueprints. Add society to your blueprint as a stakeholder. They are a stakeholder. How can you make all of those lives easier? OK, so these were just a few tips to get started. And I'd, I'd love to hear from you for, for what you guys use. Um, um, but this isn't really about, you know, it's not really about ethics, actually. I don't think it's about morals. I think this is not about CSR programs. This is, because I think that actually sidelines our role as designers. I think um, design has never been so fundamental to business and society. And actually, I think it is just what good design is now. Um, and I think ultimately, it's about challenging the normal, like my shit school days, but doing it every day, challenging the briefs you get. And actually, once you start doing that, when you really start looking at those briefs, you'll probably get really angry and grumpy. And that's a good thing, because you'll move on to getting really excited. Just don't get grumpy with your client. Just get excited with them. And you'll start doing this stuff. Because I think we can take the rubber tires off. We can stop them going on in the first place. And we won't get it right every time. But there's plenty of opportunity. And we want those children in 100 years' time to say, what the fuck was going on with Facebook back in 2017? And then they can say, well, you know what? It was designers that fixed it. All that community of diverse designers, they put it right. So let's talk about it, and thank you so much for listening.